Good morning. Welcome to First United Methodist Church. Our announcements for today on May the 15th, fifth Sunday of Easter. Food ministry is in desperate need of canned fruit. So if you have anything in your pantry or you can go to Dollar Tree or Dollar General or wherever and pick up some canned fruit and bring it to the church office, it would be greatly appreciated. The meetings for May, trustee meeting is Monday, May the 16th at 5.30. Finance Tuesday, 17th at 5.30. Leadership Council, Wednesday, May the 18th at 5.30. All meetings will be held in the Bible classroom. That's our announcements for today. Thank you. Good morning. Stand as you're able. Join me in our call of work to worship. Spirit of the living God, Fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Let's pray. God, you dwell among us, giving to all who believe the repentance that leads to life. We rejoice in you, Lord, for we are a forgiven people. May the Spirit lead us on to perfection through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our first hymn is number 547. O Church of God United, let us sing. <coughs> and imprinted in your brain, I invite you to pick up the Apostles' Creed that's probably in the hymn rack in front of you and let us confess our faith together. We do so by saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I want to invite uh, Georgia and Con uh, Carter, I started to say Carterly, uh, Georgia and uh, Carter to come up front. And uh, Jim, I'm going to switch to the free walking microphone. There we go. How about that? All right. So uh, I should probably talk about John a little bit before I do so. Hold that. You see. Carter Odom and Georgia Connerly, uh, they are both graduating Jackson High School, and then they're going uh, to the same educational institution in opposite directions, uh, Coastal in Thomasville and Coastal in um, Fairhope, is that true? All right, not Mobile, Fairhope. That's the sophisticated Coastal campus, all right. Uh, We're proud of them, they are finishing one stage in their life and starting another, and uh, their parents and grandparents just got used to this stage, and now they're gonna have to get used to the next stage. And so uh, we're grateful for them, and we wanna pray for them. Um, and we have a couple of gifts to give them and send them on their way. Uh, but first, let's pray. Uh, God, we are grateful for Georgia and for Carter. We are grateful for all the effort that they uh, have put into uh, these first 12 years or so of school. We're grateful for their families, how they've raised them up and encouraged them. God, we're grateful that they um, have made a, a commitment in their life to be here to worship. We're grateful, God, for all that you are doing in their life. And now we pray as they step out into uh, the next part of their journey with a little more freedom, uh, more options, <laughs> God, we pray that uh, your Holy Spirit would guide them and be an ever-present help, both in times of joy and in times of trouble. We pray, O oh God, that through Jesus Christ, they might uh, see the unseen, uh, minister to those who are less fortunate than themselves, and above all, treat all that they meet with your love, Jesus. Bless them as they have been a blessing to us. This we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh, so you don't get all of that. So, all right. um, so let me make sure. All right. There's a, a book that I hope you guys will use. 30 Days with Wesley. And let's see, I was instructed that the little present is for you. My guess is you can get in trouble with it. This one is yours. I don't think you'll get in trouble with that. <laughs> Let's congratulate this young man. Okay. <laughs> oh, I'm good. Okay. Very good. All right. Uh, we are grateful that we can uh, celebrate with them and with their families. Uh, it's a big achievement, uh, especially you have to consider. <clears throat> They're graduating high school having gone through something none of you have ever gone through. You realize that? Unless, no, I don't. None of y'all are old enough to have been in high school in the Spanish flu. Uh, <laughs> Myra, what you look at me that way for? <clears throat> they, they've done something you've never done successfully. That's incredible, y'all. They've seen a lot. They know a lot because they've seen a lot, right? Like the farmer's insurance guy. We are grateful for them and uh, for the extraordinary success that they have in the times that they live in. And we pray that God has somehow 
through all that's gone on, prepared them uh, for their lives ahead. We're grateful for your gifts. Your gifts go to support things like gifts for high school seniors as they graduate high school. Your gifts go to support the ministry of this church and the ministry of the United Methodist Church all around the world. And um, I'm grateful for you and for your faithfulness, your financial faithfulness. That's part of what it means to be a disciple of Christ. Uh, Janet was uh, listening to a, a seminar the other day and uh, everybody wants to change the world. And some of you uh, have the foresight to pay for it. And we're grateful because change doesn't just happen. Somebody has to support it. And uh, not only with your heart, but also with your wallet. And we are grateful for your gifts, grateful for your expression of faithfulness. Would you stand with me? We're going to sing the doxology and praise and thanksgiving to God for what we all have been able to give that we have received from God's own hand. Come on up. fun to watch, aren't they? Bless their hearts. Like, quit watching it, right? I don't have you on camera, so, like, people aren't at home going, <laughs> yeah, they're looking at me going, <laughs> right. So we talked about Peter last week, right? Peter the Apostle. And uh, does anybody remember anything about Peter? Ah, oh, man, I got, we got to do better. All right, so Peter was a fisherman. Peter was a follower of Jesus Christ. Peter uh, actually denied that he knew Jesus the night before Jesus died. He, he denied it three times. Peter wound up being one of God's greatest disciples of Jesus Christ and preaching and all of that sort of thing. Peter is in a place called Joppa and he's up on the rooftop. Back in those days, the coolest spot was not in the house where the fire was, where they were cooking, but up on the roof. They're kind of like a deck, right? So he was up there, he was hungry, he was waiting for, waiting for food. And uh, the Bible says that he's praying and, and uh, in a vision he sees a, a sheet, like a tablecloth set down, and there's all kinds of animals on it. But they're animals that he's not supposed to eat because he's a, he's a Jewish believer. Right? So he's not supposed to eat pig, and he's not supposed to eat catfish, and he's not supposed to eat shrimp. I know, shocking, right? That just cut out the whole southeast. Like, we're lost as a he hang because we live on catfish and shrimp down here, right? And Koneka sausage, which is, I think God likes Koneka sausage, I'll be honest with you. Uh, not sponsored by Koneka sausage, but we'd be willing to have a discussion. Um, so this happens, and, and God says, kill and eat. He's like, what? I can't eat that stuff. Whew. Goes back up. Comes back down. You, you need to eat this, Peter. No, I can't do that, God. Whew. Goes back up. Third time it comes down. Well, these animals on it. And then all of a sudden, some people knock at the door. And they're people that Peter's not supposed to be hanging out with because they're not Jewish. But they knock at the door and they say, Peter, 
We need you to come and talk about Jesus. Because we all want to know about Jesus. And Peter gets up and he goes and he does what God tells him to do because God has shown him that these rules about what you're supposed to eat and who you're supposed to hang out with, those are rules that people made up. And Jesus said we're to love everybody and to tell everybody about him. And so that's what Peter does. He gets up and he goes and he tells them about Jesus. And the Bible says that there's all that, that the whole house uh, believed uh, in Jesus. So I'm going to give you some stickers with some animals on them. All right. I bet you would like. So I'm going to give you some stickers with some animals on them to remind you this week, right? To talk about Jesus to somebody, to tell somebody that Jesus loves them all. Okay? Regardless, there's all kinds of animals on there. Here, you look pretty bummed out with the Hello Kitty sticker. How about the hammerhead shark? Right? No, that's trash. That's trash. What the hell? All right. So... So there's all kinds of animals. You even have some animals without legs, right? <coughs> right? Shark's an animal without a leg, right? It's got fins. You can't eat sharks. You can't eat sharks? Okay. But the Bible says but the Bible says we're not supposed to in the Old Testament. I don't know about you, but I like catfish, so I'm gonna be here. Right? So it's the same way with who we're supposed to love. We're supposed to love everybody. And so I, that's what I want you to remember this week. Let's pray. God, thank you that you showed Peter that there isn't any unclean food in your kingdom and there aren't any unclean people. There are only people who need to hear about Jesus. Help us to be like Peter, to go and tell people about Jesus. This we ask in your name, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thanks, y'all. Sharks, horses, and, and Hello Kitties. That's all I got. All right. And Hello Douglas.
I invite you to take the silence of a moment. Focus your heart on the prayer needs and concerns that you have. Now I encourage you to give those over to the Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. We worship your holy name. God and Father of us all, we pray today for your church. We're grateful for your church gathered here at First Methodist in Jackson, Alabama. We're grateful for your church gathered throughout Clark County. We especially thank you for all of the United Methodist churches that we are connected to with, that we are partners in the gospel with, both in our Mobile District and around the Alabama West Florida Conference. We're grateful that your church, even uh, your United Methodist Church is at work even in Ukraine and in other places around Ukraine. We thank you for the gifts of your people to the United Methodist Committee on Relief, UMCOR. And we pray that your church would continue to minister to the needs of refugees and immigrants, those who are fleeing from war, God, thank you that we are able to help in some small way in a very big moment in people's lives. We pray, oh God, for our bishop and DS, for all of the leaders of our church. We pray especially for the leaders of our church here at Jackson. God, grant them wisdom, grant them the courage to be Christ-like in all that they do. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray, oh God, for the world that we live in, a world that's filled with wars and rumors of war, with famine, with prejudice, with hardship, God, if we only looked at what we saw around us, we might be hopeless. But God, we know that you are working all of those situations. You are working through people whose heart is full with the love of Jesus. You are in those places where there are roars and rumors of wars. You are in those places where there is famine. Famine not only of the belly, but also of the heart and of the spirit. You are there, God. Your work continues even unseen by our physical eyes. We know that you are at work. We pray, O oh God, for the leaders of the nations to turn their swords into plowshares, that their weapons of destruction might be turned into opportunities for construction and for reconciliation. We pray, God, for the peace of Christ that passes all understanding to be the peace that is present in all of our communities, in all the nations. God, thank you for your people who are at work to achieve that. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray, O oh God, for those hurting in body, mind, and spirit this morning, those recovering from operations and procedures and treatments and all of those things, those who are grieving this morning, who are on the road to living with the memory of one that has departed, the memory that is a blessing. We pray, God, for those who are caregivers. God, I pray especially this morning for therapists and 
counselors who are called to walk alongside those who are journeying in their spirit, who are overcoming trauma, who are working out their grief, who are working out their salvation with fear and trembling. Bless them, O oh Lord, we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We give you thanks for the communion of saints this morning. For those who uh, taught us in school, who taught us in Sunday school, who sat with us in church, who worked in our lives in so many different ways, ways that we could not see. We thank you, O oh God, for your provenient grace that brought those people into our lives. We're thankful for the communion of saints, thankful for how they invested their lives in ours that we might be better people, not just good citizens, but Christians who are called according to your name. We give you thanks for their lives and we pray that our lives might honor them, might honor you and might inspire others. This we pray through Christ our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray together, Jesus, as you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. <coughs> Please stand if you're able for our scripture today. 
scriptures from Acts 11, 1 through 18. Now the apostles and the brothers and sisters who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain it to them step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheep coming down from heaven, being lured by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice say to me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, By no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time the voice answered from heaven, What God has made clean you must not call profane. This happened three times. Then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we went. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire house will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just said it, as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced, and they praised God, saying, then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Thank, thank you, Dottie. I love how the Spirit is specific in this. Give Simon, who is called Peter. He didn't just say Simon, because that might have, Simon the Tanner can't help you in this situation. Go get Simon, who's called Peter. I, uh, last week, uh, towards the end of my sermon, I said if there's one thing we've learned in this passage, the one from last week about Dorcas, and then we ended up reading that part where Simon go, Peter goes to stay at the house of Simon the Tanner for some time. I said if there's one thing we've learned in this passage is that there are no unclean people in the kingdom of God. Whether you're dead or dying, Gentile, whether you're unclean by some religious standard or not, there are no unclean people in the kingdom of God, only children of God who need to be nurtured by the loving people of God who get up, who love mercy, who act justly, and walk humbly with their God. And then I encourage you to get up and go in the name of Jesus and be a Dorcas, uh, or Peter to the widows and the tatters of this world. So what does it mean to be unclean in the Old Testament, the, the Jewish laws? What does it mean to be unclean? How do you get to be unclean? Now, I, I want to draw your attention to Leviticus. It's a, a, a highly sought after preaching a part of the Bible. Leviticus chapter 11. Did your daddy ever preach out of Leviticus 11? Did he? I'd love, I'd love to heard Jake preach out of that. All right, so here we go. This is how you can be unclean. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying to them, speak to the people of Israel saying, from among all the land animals, these are the creatures you may eat. Any animal that has divided hoofs and is cleft footed and chews the cud, which sounds like a cow. But among those that chew the cud or have divided hoofs, you shall not eat the following. The camel, for even though it chews the cud, it does not have divided hoofs, for it is unclean to you. 
The rock badger, for even though it chews the cud, it does not have divided hoofs. It is unclean for you. The hare, for even though it chews the cud, it does not have divided hoofs. It is unclean for you. The pig, for even though it has divided hoofs and is cleft footed, it does not chew the cud. It is unclean for you. Of their flesh you shall not eat, their carcasses you shall not touch. These are unclean for you. These you may eat, all that are in the waters, everything in the water that has fins and scales, whether in the seas or in the streams. But anything in the seas or streams that does not have fins and scales, of the swarming creatures in the waters. It's about here that people kind of glaze over. <laughs> By the way, you can't eat. Okay, can't eat the eagle. The vulture, the osprey, the buzzard, the kite of any kind, every raven of any kind, the ostrich, the night hawk, the seagull, the hawk of any kind. Now, I've got a friend, he says chicken hawk's not bad, it's a little chewy. <laughs> the stork, the heron, the hoopoe, and the bat. Okay, so if we just leave off how you can become unclean by eating improperly, God bless us. If you're a woman and you have a son, you're unclean for seven days. Just because you had a son. It's about two weeks for a daughter. Um, and then chapter 13 talks about leprosy. and It starts talking about bulls and the hair in the bull and the... And then it starts talking about discharges. I've got a friend, whenever he hears that word, he just doesn't do it. <laughs> if anyone loses the hair from his head, he is bald, but he is clean. Woo! <laughs> if he loses the hair from his forehead and his temples, he has the baldness of the forehead, but he is clean. But if there is on the bald head or the bald forehead a reddish white disease spot, you're unclean. So there's a lot of things in the Old Testament you could become religiously unclean about. Right? Eating catfish and shrimp is one of them. And I've eaten some shrimp this week. I had some last night. It was mighty fine. Okay. I probably won't be eating catfish today, but I'll be unclean in other ways. I'm almost certain I will consume pork before the day is over. I will be religiously unclean. Jesus came and said, look, no offense, but that was then. This is now. And now I have a new commandment for you. Love one another. And then Jesus showed us what it meant to love one another. And, and then he showed us what it meant for it all to be clean in God's sight. Now we all have preferences. We all go through changes in our lives. Uh, holy cow, apparently the world can live on broccoli and chicken breast. Right? Like broccoli seems to be the vegetable. And chicken breast, it's everything. Between your nuggets, your boneless wings, which aren't really a wing at all. I'm pretty sure they're going to create a chicken with eight breasts and 20 wings and no feet. Because nobody, well, okay. It'll be a strictly a southeastern thing because we don't typically eat chicken feet. Everywhere else in the world, they love chicken feet. But we like, no, we want from the knees up. <laughs> The rest of that is unclean to us. <clears throat> we have people who don't eat dark meat chicken because it's dark. That's the best part of the chicken. That's fine. Leave it for the rest of us. I, I want a chicken with like Arnold Schwarzenegger thighs. You know. But you know, we're that way with people. There are certain people we look at and certain people are around and they're kind of unclean to us. We just really don't have a lot to do with them. They're, 
They're not our kind of people. Well, they're God's kind of people. And you know, in my life, that sort of thing has changed. Um, I, I'm, I'm different about people than I used to be. We're, we're living in an age where nationalism and, and xenophobia is having its heyday because of spam bots and misinformation and twisted stories in the media. We even have that in our own community, the rumors and rumors of rumors and the slight kernel of truth that gets twisted around worse than the stripped out head of a Phillips head screwdriver screw when you're trying to repair something. And I guess this idea of people being unclean can stretch from something that's benign, although it is incredibly harmful because I was that child. You make sure they get picked last on the playground for dodgeball or anything else. I was that kid. Fat, four-eyed, red-headed. Right? I was that kid. Shout out to all the fat, four-eyed, red-headed kids because we survived. Don't come at me, bro. I have years of anger built up starting way back in first grade. That's fairly benign. But then we have Friday where an 18-year-old travels for hours to shoot people of color with a gun in Buffalo, New York, simply because of the color of their skin through some crazy thing called the replacement theory. It's amazing how many polite names we have for hatred. In his sight, they were unclean because they didn't look like him. Well, I've got news for him. If convicted, he's going to go to a place where <laughs> they don't look like him. And he'll spend the rest of his life alone. Because if he gets out, somebody will call him unclean. I'm so glad that Jesus has called us to live beyond that narrow worldview and to reach out to people who are different from us. Calls us to live a life of grace, to, to live a life in the Spirit. We looked at those rules in Leviticus and they're so hard to live by. There's so many no-goes there. I, I, I was reading a book this week and, and about grace and about Jesus and, and I was reminded in this book of, of a couple of lines when it was talking about Jesus. Jesus came with a list of do's rather than don'ts. And one of the lines from the book was, forbidden from touching the flesh of lepers, the rotting flesh of lepers, he, that is Jesus, embraced and healed him. You'll find that in Matthew chapter 8. Forbidden from being touched by a menstruating woman, he acknowledged the touch of a woman with a, with a discharge and then applauded her faith in Luke 8. Do you remember the woman? She'd had an issue of blood for years and spent all of her money with doctors trying to be healed. And she said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I don't have to be properly introduced. I don't have to know him. I don't have to meet him if I can just touch the hem of his garment. And then in one fell swoop, the book says, he rejected his religion's disdain for Samaritans and for women by spending an afternoon with a Samaritan woman by a well, lifting her to dignity. The radical freedom of Jesus embodied God's freedom to love beyond religious boundaries. Remember that old song, He Touched Me? Oh, He touched me. Oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened and now I know he touched me and made me whole. The woman that touched the hem of his garment couldn't sing that song. She didn't get a chance for Jesus to touch her. She had faith. She just touched the hem of his garment. Y'all, what a difference you could make in the life of somebody. 
If, if just touching the hem of Jesus' garment will make them whole, how much more a life lived in the grace of God help them to become whole? Well, we live in the provenient grace of God. We're, we're, we're good Methodists. We believe in the provenient grace of God. The grace that goes before. The grace that comes before we are made alive in Christ. We believe that God is at work in our lives even when we cannot see it. God was at work in my life through Dewey Ott and Ernest Schrader and Brother Sam Sharp and Sister Wheeler. Sister Wheeler, they would say, she's Pentecostal. <laughs> when Sister Wheeler sang in the choir, she had a little, she had a little hop to her. And every song she had that little hop to her, she was Pentecostal. <laughs> but she was in Dry Valley Baptist Church. I still remember Sister Wheeler. And that's been 50 years ago or better. She made an impact in my life. She was at work in my life when I didn't even know it. Brother Tiny Durrance, Dr. Fred Whitmer, Paul Lloyd, Gabriel McCray, John Hennington, Grace McWhorter, Deb McCraney, June Jernigan, Dunk. All of these people have been part of God's prevenient grace at work in my life. Before I ever knew them, they were already part of God's work in my life and in my family. Poor Janet, she had no idea. <laughs> she, she had no idea. If she had known, I, she might not be here this morning, but she had no idea. God bless her mom and daddy. They had no idea either. <laughs> These and others who have received the Holy Spirit have been part of God's work in my life. And you can go back and tell that same story. The names, only the names will have been changed. Right? To, to protect the innocent. Or to promote the innocent. You can tell that same story. People who have been at work in your life and you had no idea. And you wonder how God's graciousness is at work in your life. It starts sometimes with that elementary school teacher who never knew that they were going to have the little fat, four-eyed, red-headed kid that needed to be loved and encouraged. Sometimes it starts with you at church. You're not much on the little kids, but boy, they remember you. And maybe it continues on when you're asked to keep, teach the scary teenagers. Or as a friend of mine, when he was going to seminary, they put him in a Sunday school class to teach 80 and 90 year old women who had walked with Jesus three times he longer than he'd been alive. And they certainly knew more than any seminary was going to teach him. Thanks be to God, he had them to teach him while he was at seminary. There are people who probably in your eyes seem unclean that are part of God's work in your life. And if you don't have those people in your life, are you trying to hinder God? Peter said, who am I to hinder God? <laughs> I had a youth, when I was a youth pastor at uh, First Baptist Hoover, I told my youth group that I was uh, that God was calling me to go be a pastor at Lucille Baptist Church in West Block, Alabama. And uh, as a good youth minister, I expected a lot of wailing and gnashing of teeth and crying and oh, he's leaving us. It, no. <laughs> yeah. And I said, "Do you have any questions?" And one of my old saints, I think she was 14 or 15 at the time, but she was, a, she was an old person. Robin Jones said, well, you said God's calling you. You don't expect us to go against God, do you? I said, like, okay, maybe she had listened to some of that stuff I've been trying to teach her. She's also the, she's also the kid that used to say, this is America, we have choices. I like that. I like that idea. Praise God that he's given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. Those unclean, uncircumcised people. 
that Peter was hanging out with and even eating with and even spending the night in their home with. <laughs> and when Peter told the busybodies in Jerusalem that wanted to know why he was breaking their rules, he said, oh, there's a bigger rule. And the bigger rule is Jesus who said to love and if they've received the Holy Spirit just as you've received the Holy Spirit, who are we to hinder God? And those busy bodies in Jerusalem said, well, he's got us there. We don't know what to say about that. Praise God. <coughs> Praise God. You know, growing in your faith is scary. You, you have to let go of some things that you've, you've held on to for a long time that, that you thought were the truth. And come to find out it was just somebody else's truth. It wasn't God's truth. Like I, I kept looking for footprints in the sand when we went to Israel, but there's, it's grassy on the banks of the Sea of Galilee. It looks like a TVA kind of thing, really. There's some things you have to let go of. There's, there's some kind of understanding that you have to let go of to gain a more mature understanding, to go on to perfection, to become the Christian that God has called you to be. Not to sit where you were, but to strive towards where God wants you to be. And sometimes you have to let go of some stuff to grab hold of what God has for you here. And part of that for Peter was to not look at people as if they were unclean because they were uncircumcised or because they were tanners or because they ate catfish and shrimp or because whatever. <clears throat> Maybe this is what happens to all those. This is the scary part for parents when their kids go to college. I can only imagine what my mom and daddy went through. That's back before Facebook and Texting and I called home once every couple of weeks. Collect. Y'all remember that? <laughs> Will you accept a collect call from Bud? <laughs> yeah, well, we will. You know, God forbid if they ever said, nah. <laughs> what would we have done back in the day? What would we have done? I mean, no, you won't take my phone call? Well, I ain't got no money to call you back any other way. <laughs> we go off to college where our parents wanted us to go. We go off and we learn like they taught us we should be learning. And we go off and we hear different things than what we heard maybe at home or at our small high school or our large high school, we go off and we learn and they've been telling us all our lives to think for ourselves and when we start doing, it's scary. It's scary for us and it's scary for them. But they did the same thing. Some of them like my daddy did it in the, in the hold of a munitions ship in World War II. Some of you all learned it when you jumped out of your first perfectly good airplane with a parachute government issued on your back. And they told you it would they told you it would work. Even though you knew the person that packed it, they told you it would work. God is calling all of us to deconstruct some of those things in our lives that we're holding on to that hold us back from going like Peter did and living and loving in Jesus' name. It's hard. It's scary. It's not easy. But you don't do it by yourself. It's all part of changing your mindset to that of Christ. And the same Holy Spirit who led me through my moments leads you through your moments. Is the same Holy Spirit who 
fell upon the Gentiles in Cornelius' house and in the surrounding area is the same Holy Spirit who came upon the disciples originally. The same Holy Spirit who is present at Jesus' baptism, who is who brooded over the waters of creation, is the same Spirit who's present at your baptism. And it's the same Holy Spirit who calls you clean before God the Father through Jesus Christ His Son. And what God has called clean, we have no right to call unclean. That's why Jesus said, They'll know your disciples, my disciples, by your love. A new command I give you. Love one another. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Would you stand as you're able and let's sing our closing hymn, The Spirit Song, on page 347. And love each other in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 Amen.